This slide highlights the bond angles of the carbon-hydrogen bonds connected to a cyclohexane ring. So it's going to adopt this chair conformation and that's going to lead to really two groups of hydrogens. One's called axial and the other equatorial. Axial ones highlighted in red here point either straight up from the uh, chair or straight down. Equatorial, uh, report all, they point out to the sides but not directly horizontally. And you can make out that uh, especially when you put this all together for the complete cyclohexane that every carbon that has a axial bond that's pointing straight up also has an equatorial bond that's pointing downward at an angle. And the reverse of that is true. So that ends up giving you three axial up hydrogens, three axial down hydrogens on alternating carbons. And again, the equatorial bonds alternate in the same way. A carbon that has an equatorial up position is neighbored by carbons that have equatorial down. So when we start replacing any of these hydrogens with things like methyl groups or anything larger than that, that's when axial and equatorial become important. And as we'll see, just like we have staggered conformations that are better, better than eclipsed, uh, we're going to find that substitution at equatorial positions is favored over axial. So we want to be able to draw chairs that distinguish those two. This may seem like a rather minor type of thing to be paying so much attention to, whether it's axial or equatorial. But um, even though we're just dealing with cyclohexane derivatives, there's lots of complicated molecules for which this kind of thing comes into play. And these structures here are just fragments of giant polymer molecules, the top one corresponding to cellulose, which is essentially what cotton is made of, and the bottom one starch that we get from so many of the foods we eat, like potatoes. And uh, when you look at the structures to compare starch and cellulose, you find it hard to find differences. These are rings that are not quite cyclohexane rings because you can see there's an oxygen replacing one of the carbons in the ring, plus we've got some OH groups hanging off. Um, but we've got a bunch of chair conformations of what would be a glucose molecule. That's what each of these repeating units is, is a glucose ring. And in cellulose, they are interconnected through what's an axial bond, excuse me, an equatorial bond to an oxygen. Whereas in starch, that same bond is axial. And that's the only difference in these two different materials, as different as they are. Uh, in real life, we're not going to be substituting cotton for a potato when we... Uh, start to eat, but uh, the structures of the cellulose and the cotton and the starch and the potatoes are very similar, only different with regard to these kinds of uh, three-dimensional arrangement of bonds. So we're going to stick with rings one at a time here, but uh, we're still going to, like I say, pay, pay attention to whether things are axial or equatorial. And for cyclohexane itself, this diagram is kind of like what we saw before with the ethane and butane. And it shows that the chair arrangements at the bottom are the most stable. Anything that does not correspond to a chair arrangement is uh, correspondingly less stable. Uh, either because you have eclipsing of bonds, like in this half chair, um, or the bond angles uh, are not close to 109 degrees. And what this is showing is if you start with the chair in this arrangement on the bottom left, going through this flipping of the ring uh, ends up giving you another equivalent chair. But notice these two structures at the bottom are not rubber stamp copies of each other. Uh, once that chair goes through this kind of flipping, as it's called, bonds that are equatorial become axial and vice versa. And that's an important uh, distinction uh, to make as we go forward.